Okay, I'm going to talk about autonomous vehicles and machine learning safety. I've been doing self-driving car safety for more than 25 years, but I've also done safety in a lot of other domains as well. And so this is my very quick attempt to wrap up, to, to pull together a bunch of the lessons learned and sort of the state of the art uh, as it applies to the, the charter of this uh, organization. Uh, and there we go. So a quick overview, I'm going to talk about getting past the safety rhetoric and hype, uh, safety engineering in a nutshell, why machine learning breaks safety engineering, core machine learning safety technical issues, the ANSI UL 4600 standard, which is specific to, to autonomous vehicle safety, and some food for thought beyond technical safety metrics, because the real answers have to be more than technical for this uh, to get really true uh, AI that is suitable for life critical use. So diving right in, getting past the AV safety rhetoric. Nobody knows when or even if autonomous vehicles will be safer than human drivers. You keep hearing relentlessly pounded in, oh, they're going to be safer. But when you dig down, you'll find out it's all aspirational. It's all messaging. A lot of it's just outright propaganda. Nobody knows if they'll ever be safer. I mean, ever. 100 years from now, yeah, sure. But given current technology, nobody really knows if these will ultimately be safer in other than extremely constrained situations. We already have automatic trains. I'm going to be riding one later today at the airport, and they're very safe. But when you go out on open roads with other road users, especially pedestrian bicycles, stuff like that, nobody knows if that problem is solvable in the near future. We certainly hope. We certainly can do better than people, maybe. But it's unknown. Now, what you'll hear, the usual line is, well, humans drive drunk and computers won't drive drunk. It turns out humans are still impressively good. I have the number in another slide. And, and one hopes that computers won't make all the same mistakes people make, but computers will have their own mistakes. And it's unclear whether the computer mistakes are going to outweigh the human mistakes. Human, computers lack common sense. Uh, and th now that's an anthropomorphization, but what the core problem comes down to, they're very brittle when encountering novelty. And so they're going to make stake, mistakes that humans would never make. Just completely, we would call them stupid mistakes. So they'll fail differently, and we don't know how the balance is going to turn out. Uh, and it used to be people would say, well, yeah, maybe it's going to have trouble deciding what's in front of it, but it's knows something there, it won't hit it. Well, that even that one got disproven a couple months ago when an um, uncrewed robotaxi hit a bus in San Francisco. And it's like the bus is right there. It actually saw the bus, but it was an articulated two-part bus, and it decided to follow the first half of the bus and not the second half, and so it hit it. The takeaway from this is that machine learning and, and uh, AI is not magic, and we're going to have, if we want safety, we're going to have to engineer it. You can't just say computers never make mistakes. Anyone who says that has apparently never used a computer, I guess, right? Uh, there are all sorts of bad things that can happen from computers, just like people, and we have to do engineering to make sure we get safety. So what's safety engineering? Well, conventional vehicle is about one fatality per 100 million miles. That includes all the drunks and the speeders and the people who aren't wearing seatbelts and all the other things. You know, that's an impressively low rate per meter, and you have to look at it per meter because there's a lot of things that happen in a mile, and, and every one of them is an opportunity to make mistakes. So meter is probably a better uh, metric here. Uh, and that's really, really hard to do for anyone. Humans get there, even including the drunks. It's really quite impressive. And to match that, the computer is going to take a lot of work. The other thing you hear is this presumption, this pervasive presumption that, well, we're out there road testing because testing makes it safe. Testing does not make anything safe, never has, never will. You don't get testing, you don't get safety by testing. It doesn't work that way, and it doesn't work that way in any domain. And even worse, this is not something you can test in submission because you'd be need a billion kilometers or more to prove safety statistically under a bunch of somewhat unrealistic assumptions. And by the way, if you change the software, well, it's not the same car anymore. You reset the odometer in billion. Now, you can be smarter than that. The industry is smarter than that. But the point is they're not going brute force. They're using various types of engineering rigor to avoid the brute force. So how do you get safety? Safety engineering, not just cars, all the domains I've ever looked at, it comes down to use engineering rigor. You use safety engineering. You identify and mitigate hazards. Say, here are all the things that can go wrong that are a problem. You use engineering rigor responsive to the risk presented. 
aircraft falls out of the sky if something goes wrong, well, that's a high engineering of rigor. Uh, minor nuisance, that can be a lower engineering of rigor. You don't want a lot of nuisances, but you don't have to throw the whole kitchen sink of engineering rigor at it. So all the safety standards that you see one way or another say, let's do some hazard analysis, let's do some risk assessment, and the higher the risk, the more engineering rig you throw at it. That's how we know to do safety today. Testing does not find defects. We don't fly an aircraft around and then fix it every time it crashes. You know, that's not your go-to for an aircraft. You design engineering rigor in, and the flight test is supposed to prove you got it right. Testing validates hazard mitigation and engineering quality. So anyone who says we're going to drive self-driving cars around and, and when they stop crashing, they're safe. That is not how safety engineering works. That's just going around messing around to, to, to try and get it to work. Um, not enough for life critical stuff. Maybe okay for infotainment and apps, not good enough for life critical. There are safety standards. ISO 26262 is for conventional vehicles. That's been around more than a decade. ANSI UL 4600, which I'll get to in, in a couple slides, uh, has been out since 2020. And that one's specific to fully autonomous vehicle. But conformance is patchy. I don't know of any company that will stand up and say, yes, we absolutely follow the standard 100%. Uh, for either of these standards, and some of them show what amounts to contempt for the, stand, for the standards. They say, no, they don't apply to us. We're special. There's some companies to do this. And there is no requirement to follow these. Every other safety critical uh, application, and I've done rail, and I've done petrochemical and scary power supplies and consumer electronics and a little bit of medical. In all those, one way or another, the companies follow the standards. There is no requirement whatsoever to make companies follow the standards and the industry themselves wrote the standards. So you have these companies not even following the safety standards they themselves wrote. That's where we are in conventional cars. And for autonomous vehicles, it's more of the same. So why is this such a big deal? I mean, we, we already had this issue with conventional cars, but, but you know, the car companies have a lot of experience. They've learned a lot of lessons. Someone like me can find fault with some of what they do, but and, and people don't like the fatality rate on the roads, but you know it's still, it's still not so bad. We'd like to do better, but that isn't something that people are, are working as hard as they might to change. It's, it's we sort of accept it as a status quo for better or worse. But machine learning breaks all that. That status quo gets broken when you pull in machine learning. The primary concern, or a primary concern for machine learning in this area, is perception prediction. You do, can do a lot of stuff with traditional software. But deciding what you're looking at is a primary need for machine learning. Not only what you're looking at, but what's going to happen next. Now, there's a little animation I have up from a, a movie called Mitchell's and the Machines, which, which is surprisingly on point. They have this weird character that's supposed to be a dog, but the robots say dog, pig, pig, dog, whatever. And then they, they have a system error and their heads explode, and that's how our heroes win the thing. I only wish current machine learning were that sophisticated. It'll go dog, pig, dog, pig. I'm going with pig today. 100% confidence and off it goes. Now, dog versus pig, maybe not such a big deal, but pedestrian versus picture of pedestrian on a bus billboard or pedestrian versus, versus trash can at the side of the road, those kind of things matter a lot because they affect safety. And right now, a common failure mode is the machine learning. When it sees something it hasn't been trained on very well, it often has supreme confidence in something that a person would say is totally ridiculous. And I'll have an example of that, of that kind of thing in a minute. So the data-centric training approach you've heard about breaks safety engineering because safety engineering depends on traceability. Going back to the V model, the, the, the famous V model, the point is on the left, you, you intentionally design and you trace the design of the implementation and the testing is, yeah, sure enough, the thing I implemented matches the design and I've done safety engineering, so I'm building confidence in the process. Okay, but with machine learning, um, the model isn't traceable to the requirements. You may have a bunch of requirements, but you train and the model is what the model is and you just try to see how it turned out. And that breaks safety engineering. Now, there are approximations of things. Yeah, lots of smart people are working on this, but that's a fundamental issue that we're not done solving it. The next one is people say, well, we're just going to simulate it up the wazoo and, and prove it safe via brute force simulation. Well, first of all, the simulation becomes life critical, so good luck using gaming software for your life critical simulations. That, But eventually, enough money in engineering can solve that. The bigger problem is you still need billions of miles of real world to validate the simulated world. If your simulated world doesn't have people dressed in yellow in it, 
you're not going to realize that your computer can't tell that a person in yellow is a pedestrian. And that's a real example. We saw that construction workers and people in yellow raincoats weren't being detected. And, and the likely explanation was the training data didn't have a lot of people dressed in yellow, so it didn't realize there were pedestrians. So if your simulation doesn't know that color of clothing is a thing, you can simulate perfectly and you're not going to get it right. So the limit there is, first of all, you need good engineering for the simulation, but second, you need billions of miles of weird stuff in your simulator to equate to billions of miles of road use. And that's almost as hard a problem. The, the other point for why it breaks safety engineering is that it breaks the safety certification recall model. Right now, when cars are shipped, there's a useful fiction that they are perfectly safe. Now we have a recall system for when that's wrong, but typically, you didn't used to see a lot of recalls. They worked pretty well, okay? And now, with software, you're seeing lots more recalls. A lot of them have to do with software. Uh, and that's changing, even for conventional vehicles, the dynamic of, well, you know, we'll patch it later, and that there's a moral hazard. There's a lot of issues there. But for AVs, there's no choice between security and the fact that if the world changes, you have to retrain to accommodate the new world and update your models. This is going to be a life cycle change that's really going to fundamentally change how safety has to work. Now, there's some core technical issues. Uh, so this is getting down into the hardcore technology. The, the first and biggest ones is long tail events are handled poorly. So you may have a lot of things that you don't see often. Now, everyone on this, everyone looking at this knew that that was a person in chicken suit. I mean, I grew up on a farm, so I know yellow chickens aren't actually a thing when they're adults, right? But also you see the sneakers, it's like that's a person, right? But if you're back to the system that doesn't know that things in yellow are pedestrians, you know, just because the computer didn't notice it's pedestrian doesn't make it okay to hit it. And you don't see that every day. You know, maybe I've seen that once, but if the machine hasn't seen it, it doesn't know what to do. And it turns out safety at one per hundred million miles, safety is not about driving down the road without hitting stuff for a few hundred miles or even a few million miles. It's about the rare high consequence events and that is the opposite of what machine learning is good at. Can you work on it? Yes, you can overrepresent the, the high criticality events and the training data. There's a bunch of things you can do, but by default, going around driving, see what's out there and training machine learning gets you good at average driving. It doesn't get you safety. So that's a core technical issue, how to handle that. It's brittle for novel events. And so safety is going to be limited by even knowing that novel events are out there and what happens when you see something you haven't seen. People say, well, we'll just go out there and we'll collect all the novel events, we'll be safe. There is no end to the novel events and there's good reason to believe there are enough novel events that it's hard to say we've seen enough and, and will never be a problem. It's gonna be really hard. Experience suggests that the surprises are heavy tails. There's an infinite number of weird things. So to get safety, you're probably gonna have to be able to deal moderately safety with things that just are complete surprises. You don't have to be operational, but you have to realize you don't know what's going on, right? And machine learning is pretty bad at not knowing it doesn't know what's going on. Human drivers, by the way, they'll say, okay, let's put a human driver in charge of the autonomy and that'll fix everything. We'll just have a human mind the computer. If you watch the news, you know that that's not working out very well, right? But there's fundamental reasons why this is, and if you want to make that the default that the human supervising computer, we need some heavy lifting here on research. The approach is expecting you're going to have a perfect human supervising and not viable. We've known that since the 1940s, that people are terrible at monitoring things were that are really boring tasks. They're terrible at it. And, and monitoring the computer requires anticipating it's about to make a mistake, which means you need a good model of how the, the machine learning thing is going to going to deploy, going to behave, and now you're into explainability, which is also an issue. So if you want to go there, you're going to need a lot of progress in driver attention management. I didn't say driver monitoring. Driver monitoring just tells you you're not being good. You need better than that to be safe. You need attention management and the ability of the human to know when there's a problem, which is almost as hard or maybe even harder than solving the fully self-driving car problem. Uh, so what do you see now? You see a moral crumple zone strategy. And I would encourage you to consider this for all the applications. Moral crumple zone is this, this really cool name that, I did, that, that someone else came up with for, well, you know, we know our technology isn't fully baked. So our plan is to have a convenient human nearby, nearby to blame them instead. Uh, and so when you're rolling out machine learning for life critical applications, you need to stay out of the moral crumple zone because you're just going to get bad outcomes. But there's huge financial incentive to be first to market by, by employing that technique. 
Okay, ANSI UL 4600. This is a standard I mentioned before. I was heavily involved in the, in the creation of this standard. It was issued in 2020. The uh, version three just came out last month and version three specifically addresses heavy trucks. Uh, that's a coming thing that'll be on, that are on our roads now. And so that's addressed. And it is an assessment approach to a safety case. So a safety case is a structured argument supported by evidence that a system is suitably safe for its intended use. And so this doesn't tell you what the safety case is. It doesn't tell you step one, step two, step three, here's how to build safe AI. What it says is, so you've got safe, a safe machine learning or AI based system. That's what you say. Here's a structured way to explain why we should believe you when you say it's safe, what you meant by safe and a whole bunch of ways that people can get that argument wrong to make sure you don't fall into the known pitfalls. So it's a framework for explaining safety of machine learning based system. It applies to autonomous vehicles, but the general structure is pretty flexible. It could well go beyond that, but, but we had to narrow, so we went to, for our fully autonomous vehicles. It says, here's the minimum required content for safety cases. You have to address the following topics or we just don't believe you. Uh, a lot of, did you think of that hazard prompts? So the other hazard based standards for, for safety engineering say identify all the hazards, but they don't tell you what they might be. So this has a lot of, did you think of this? Did you think of this? Did you, did you think of people dressed as chickens in the road? Whatever, a bunch of other things that, that uh, not everyone has thought of. And there's quantitative measurement of safety case claims. There's a way to instrument the claim. So we're safe because we don't run into people. Well, why do you not run into people? Well, because we detect people and we maneuver around them if we can. If we can't, we stop as best we can and so on. Well, why, how do you know that's true? And it goes down a list of reasoning and eventually there's evidence at the bottom, but you can instrument the claims in the safety case. Like, well, you said you detected people, but what does that really mean? And it's gonna be a statistical measure because it's not gonna be perfect. And you say, all right, we have 99.9, .9, some number of nines on our camera. And you go and operate and say, well, you know what? We're only getting 98% on the camera. So even though we haven't killed anyone yet, it's just a matter of time. Our safety case is wrong. Let's go fix it you have it before we have an incident. So that's how 4600 mitigates the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty when you roll these things out. Okay, my last slide, which will leave us time for Q&A, which is good because there may be quite a few. Uh, we need to go beyond technical safety, especially you know, for national academies, we're all techies, okay? And one way or another, we like to be techies, okay? And the engineering utilitarian approach isn't enough. And so I've spent some time working with lawyers, I work with sociologists, I work with a bunch of people, ethicists, uh, and, and the kind of thing you come to realize, it's sort of humbling for a techie to realize there's more to life than the statistical outcomes. We're gonna, let's say you kill half the number of people with human driven cars. Any engineer is gonna say that's a win. And, and yes, that's a desirable outcome, but it may not be acceptable to deploy that. What if there's risk redistribution. What if you kill half as many people, but every, one, every single one is a kid in a school crosswalk? Now I'm being extreme here to make the point, but it's not okay probably to redistribute risk onto vulnerable populations for the benefit of the people buying the cars, even if the total number goes down. What if some companies say, well, you know, fatalities, we're making so much money, we can just pay off the families, even though we could have eliminated that risk, but would have cost us a month of time to market. Those are the kind of ethical issues you get into that say just the outcome of we're safer than human drivers is an insufficient set of constraints on the outcomes. Uh, now, people say we want to be as safe as a human driver or safer. Even if you believe that utilitarian approach is enough, it's actually really complicated. It's so complicated. I wrote this big book on it because it's which driver and where and what vehicle and which victims and all these things. A statistical outcome measurement is super complicated because if you compare to the national averages, it's just too easy to game. If you're driving in an easy city with no pedestrians and really nice roads, you other drivers are much better than the national average and you're only the national average, guess what? You're the, you're the most dangerous car on the road, potentially. Another way to look at this, it isn't technical, is lack of negligence. Uh, and so I just did a bunch of articles with a, with a, with a, with a, papers with a lawyer about negligence. And there you don't compare to an average driver, you compare to a reasonable driver who doesn't make mistakes. And that is an emphasis on avoiding harm rather than average outcomes that are better. I think you need some of both. Uh, lack of negligence is enough. You still want a, a, an improvement overall. 
but just looking at the net statistical outcome is not going to get you safety that society is going to be comfortable with necessarily. And, and in my experience, it probably won't. Uh, it's just you need more than that. Okay, my last point I want to leave you with is a thought, a modest proposal. Um, think about this. I would propose that any AI, including machine learning, any AI system that supplants human judgment, so the AI has tangible responsibility for making the judgment. And I don't care if there's a human patsy there to take a fall if there's a mistake. That's not really what's going on. If the AI's output has the power to make the judgment, then that AI in a proxy, a company, some proxy for that AI needs to be held accountable to human standards of negligence which is more of a legal approach than a purely technical approach, but it's easy enough to get technical requirements that stem from that. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll make these slides available. I have a bunch of pointers, but that's it for the talk, and I'm delighted to take questions.